So our, our next presentation for the afternoon um, is called Water in Iowa, Voicing the Lexicon. And it's a little bit out of the ordinary from our traditional water conference presentations. I'm actually going to let these guys kind of introduce themselves and take it away. So I hope you enjoy it. Hello, I'm Maxwell Ennis and I'm a member of the Blue Stem Institute. Don't worry, I didn't know what that meant either. Our experience with water quality began with a splash. Late December, earlier this year, um, as a class, we took a three-day trip to sites in Sac County, the ISU Agronomy Farms, and the Des Moines Waterworks. Our teachers were excited to introduce us to this, the biggest environmental problem that our state is facing today. On top of all of this, California photographer Douglas Gaten was going to be coming along with us. Douglas Gaten is the founder of the Lexicon of Sustainability, which is an organization that focuses on educating people on the basic terms and principle, principles of sustainability. Uh, he's had videos on PBS, so he's sort of a medium-sized deal. I'm thinking back to my first day meeting Douglas. We as a class were excited to be out of the classroom and in the field, but we were apprehensive because we were tasked with taking two or three images in the style that Douglas does, and we had no idea how to accomplish this. So we're on the ISU Agronomy Farm on a chilly Monday morning. For those of you that don't know, the ISU Agronomy Farm is an organic research farm here on I, at ISU. Um, and on this farm, there's, uh, and my group had been tasked with taking the image for biological fixation. On this farm, there's a soybean field and soybeans are capable of biological fixation. When I told Douglas this, he kind of grabbed me by, by my sleeve and drug me over to this soybean field. We hurried over and we crouched down, got real low, and then he stood up and yelled at Jay here. He said, where's my reflector? And crouched down. So what these images consist of is a human subject. You take one or two um, traditional photos of this person, and then you take hundreds of photos surround, of the landscape surrounding this person um, without changing the position of your feet or your head. And this is to create um, like a, a experience to the viewer of the eventual artwork similar to the photographers when they're taking the image. And this allows us to tell the complete story of what is happening um, in the image. So this entire technique that I just explained, I had no knowledge of when I was crouched down with Mr. Gayton. And I was terrified of showing my true nature, complete incompetency. But this was the beginning of a process, taking this photo, Douglas leading me through this process. This was the beginning of a process that elicited similar feelings of helplessness and incompetency. Now, these aren't usually considered positive educational outcomes, but these are feelings that we encounter in real life. Our Teachers were pushing us past the usual goals of getting B's on a test or completing a worksheet. They wanted us to produce something that we were proud to deliver to the public. That's you guys. In order to do that, we had to reject the common way of doing things in our school system, which is meeting the bare minimum in order to get a certain percentage in a class. Our new sole criterion was excellent. The only issue with this was that we had no idea how to be excellent. We had no training, and it was very uncomfortable trying to be something that we weren't. We felt like we were being thrown in the deep end, but in the end, that feeling was key to our success. Oh, I'm going to introduce you to my classmate, Maddie Kupfer. So after we got back from this trip, we had we still had to put everything together. We had three days of detailed photographs, hundreds of images that we would have to compile and piece together to create these coherent artworks. Now, just to give you an idea, if we were taking a picture for, say, biological fixation or cover crop, 
we would have a picture of a farmer, a close-up of their hand, a close-up of their face, and maybe another shot would be their body, and you know, some of it would be in focus, some of it wouldn't. But then 20 other pictures were just different shades of sky. And so it was all about creating a composition together. The goal was never to reproduce the scene as we saw it, but rather to construct a, a visual narrative that would properly encapsulate that term so that we weren't seeking to simply define these terms that we'd been assigned. As Max said, you know, we each got assigned certain terms that we had to you know, learn about and really internalize so that we could make it, we could make sense of it. And so when we were constructing these images, the point of these visual narratives was to make sure that these definitions were taken from professionals. We used their quotes, right, but then we had to make them more widely accessible. So we talked to people like Bill Stowe and Mary Skopeck, the stream monitoring coordinator of Iowa's DNR, and farmers like Bruce Carney. So as I said, we got their words as well as their pictures. And we put those over the images we'd constructed. And it was at this point that we were introduced to another unfamiliar thing. How many of you have ever, rec how many of you recognize this who aren't in Blue Stem? <laughs> We had no idea what this was. We were told it was a Wacom tablet. And that didn't mean anything to us. But eventually it came to mean that we could transfer our cursive writing, which we laid over the writing we had typed up, and drawings to help illustrate the story, the, ver the visual narrative we were creating. Um, with this little device, we were able to transfer those and put them on our images. And so they were essential to our art, but it was very unfamiliar territory, as was a lot of this class. But it was, like the rest of it, exciting. Along with all of this, we became very familiar with the critique and revision process. It wasn't just first draft, your teacher checks it. Second draft, you're done. It was you assemble photos. We help you make sure the colors are right. Does this illustration make sense over here now? Oh, no, it should probably go in the river. Wait, but we need the drawing in the river. You know, all of these different things we had never anticipated kept coming up, and we had to learn to take that with stride. And so we would take our work to our classmates, get feedback, take the work actually back to Douglas to make sure that our quality was on par with what he expected of us and we kept in contact with our experts that we had featured in the photo to make sure that all of the quotes we included were approved by them so that they felt that we were really being true to their story, which was so important to us because we had formed these relationships with people in the community and we didn't want them to feel like we had taken their words and twisted them into something that's akin to a political soundbite. And so, and so, this wasn't, like I said, about the grade. It was about a better understanding, and it was about the process. So we would like to now show you a brief video of the expedited process that went into producing these artworks. Thanks to Jake. Uh, hello, I'm Jack Winarka, another Blue Stem member. Uh, this was a class the likes of which we had never experienced before. And I'd venture to say that a lot of you hadn't experienced something like it either. I mean, sitting on a bus 50 miles from campus with some photographer from California, it didn't sound like school. 
But our, for most of us, our journey did begin in the traditional high school classroom setting. I myself was in seventh period AP literature with Mrs. Miller. I came in, I sat down next to Jack and Alvin. I thought we were just going to read some more of A Heart of Darkness that day. But to my surprise, a very excited bald man came in with a huge grin on his face and started handing us flyers. He told us about a new project-based learning class that he and his two fellow instructors had just gotten approved. He called it the Integrated Capstone Seminar. It would combine environmental science, sociology, government, English, all in one three-period block. It promised to break the molds of what we knew from a class. And some of us bought into this timeshare pitch. As soon as he left the room, you could hear whispers of, hey, are you going to take that class? Yeah, man, it sounds pretty cool. Then the first day of senior year rolled around, and 60-something students showed up in the cafeteria. Roll call was a mess. But all we did that first day was eat food. Our three teachers showed us a table of complimentary snacks and said, let us break bread together. The class seemed like a party. Free food, no tests, all right. <laughs> and then came our first assignment to take a picture of your refrigerator. And then that led to a quest to figure out where our favorite snacks came from. The whole class seemed to revolve around eating, which everyone was all right with. But what we didn't realize was that we were starting to think about something universal. Where does our food come from? We had to start connecting dots that we hadn't even ever seen before. This opened up a broader dialogue. All of a sudden, we didn't have a relationship with our food that was just a straight line. In fact, we found out we never had had that kind of relationship before. We were part of a bigger interconnected web, and every time we took a plastic bag home from the grocery store, we were contributing to an industry. We, this was a foreign idea to us. We were supporting an industry that had non-biodegradable waste. And then every time we purchase something, anything, food, put it in your mouth, all of a sudden you're casting a vote for a type of agriculture that made that food possible. And in turn, we were casting a vote for water quality because it's affected by those agricultural practices. This interconnected thinking was really important to our class. As you can see, we keep weaving in and out with these ideas because you can't do one without the other. Society and tradition influence our agricultural practices, which affects our water quality, which affects our politics and the way we talk about things, and governmental laws affect this and shape the way we treat our water and the kind of pollution we allow in our waterways. And we as a class saw how a local waterway had been treated in the past. Another Tuesday in September, we took an overnight camping trip to a park in northeast Polk County called the Chichaco Bottoms Greenbelt. Again, we couldn't believe that this was school, going on a camping trip. Within the Chichaqua, but, uh, bottoms green belt is the old skunk river uh, we would load in to our canoes and head up on the oxbows which is a fun word for a squiggly lake and we would explore this old skunk river that had been cut off from the existing river as i said we got into the water in our canoes two by two and paddled around and i personally had a rough go of it because I lied about being an experienced canoeer. <laughs> I was trusted with steering the boat, and I almost got me and my pal Frank here in the water. <laughs> but no one got too wet, so that was good. And we had so much fun in this river, and after we got out, we were all wondering, why would they cut this off? Well, they had channelized the Skunk River, to allow shipping to go faster and to free up land for farming, which are two great things. But the downside of doing that was that it speeds up the water, making it hard for some animals to live and hard for people to canoe. And also it, it creates a river that is prone to flooding. 
And then later in the month, we took three trips in a row, three field trips, three days outside of class, working with some photographer from out west. It was exciting, but it was also daunting. We were starting the project that would consume our semester and what brought us here today. Like Max said earlier, we were thrown in the deep end. But in this deep end, we had to struggle to find out how what we were learning and what we experienced connected to the outside world. The way we've been learned to approach these ideas is what we call systems thinking. The idea that we have to go and learn everything based on our own inquiry and see how things are connected because we can't understand a lawsuit about point source pollution if we don't know what point source pollution is. So we have to consult experts from a different field. We go from legal and all of a sudden we find ourselves meeting with conservationists. This is all that our class is about and it showed in our conduct too. We meditate at the beginning of class every morning. This isn't just for those few moments of calm. It's for the way we think then throughout the day. We're being more mindful. We're asking questions and we're learning to just engage. We're not worrying just about a rubric. We're really learning and we're having fun doing it. And so these complex issues don't have simple solutions. This is something else we found implementing this thinking. We have to be creative, we have to be civil, and we have to be curious to do this problem solving together. And we learned that not everything is black and white. It's not about, you know, oh, they're on this side, they're on that side, they're wrong, they're right. It's about a multifaceted issue and looking at something from every angle you can. So even looking at mandatory rules and regulations, we found that two people who thought they could be a good idea, two different experts we met with, had very different ideas of why and how we would use them. One person thought, oh, as long as we have permits in place, everything can go about business as usual. While another expert thought, no, 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 we should, we should monitor pollution, but only so that farmers can be incentivized to, to have better practices, better conservation. And so that's just one of the ways that systems thinking has helped us. But this class, beyond that, has also helped us to work in groups with each other having nothing to, you know, beyond water quality in life, you're going to have to work with people. And whether we liked it or not, we had to realize that we were going to have to meet outside of school. And we were going to have to bond over things that weren't related to our topic. Because when we had respect for each other outside of the classroom, we had each other's backs when we were inside the classroom. And so um, this style of learning has had a lot of benefits and allowed us to find teachers in each other and members of the community. And we'd like to thank the members of the community who helped us come to those understandings. Um, we might have a few of them in the room, actually. And if not, you can see them all featured in our pictures. And um, so thank you. We now invite you to step out into the hall with us to view our exhibition and continue this dialogue with the rest of the Blue Stem Institute.